Thank you for that introduction, Himanshu, and thank you so much for the invitation to come speak here today. It's a pleasure to be here in Malmo. So I'm going to um, so I, I'm going to be talking about care at scale. So which means I'm going to be talking about care at a level that we're probably not really used to thinking about it, right? At a very, very large scale. So I'm going to be focusing on sort of our shared collective infrastructural systems. So I'm going to start here by talking about technology. So this is Ursula K. Le Guin, and some of you are probably familiar, certainly with her, and possibly with this quote. Um, and Le Guin says that technology is how a society copes with physical reality. So how we get and keep food, how we clothe ourselves, our power sources, how we move around the world and the like. Um, and I love, this is my favorite definition of technology, that technology is the active human interface with the material world. And one of the things, there's actually two things I want to highlight about this. One is that she says this is how a society copes with these material realities. That's the first thing, not us as individuals. And the second thing that I really, um, uh, what I want to highlight here is that this is not what we normally think of when we think about technology, right? We think about like it's the digital and it's dematerialization and it's like everything's going to be online. And this is just a reminder that the technology is everything that gets us to that point. And in fact, part of the reason why we think of technology as all of these things is because these, these basic realities, we can take for granted. And if you're sitting here in this room today, most likely you're a person who has your basic needs met through technology in a way that means that you almost never have to think about how those needs are being met. But that's what we're going to be thinking about today and right now. So, um, as I said, a bunch of infrastructural systems are how we do this collectively as a society. And the most basic and familiar version of this is municipal water. So um, it's an infrastructural network that we've built out. This is a photo of Lake Bullman, which is about 200 kilometers from here. It's where Malmo gets its water from, or some of its water from. And the idea, I mean, it's, it's, it's very simple, right? Water flows downhill. Water can be divided into subdivided into networks, which means that it can be aqueducts and then pipes that come to our houses. Um, all of us need water every day, right? We can't postpone it until next week, right? Everyone in the room needs water. And so we have built out these collective systems that um, make it possible for us to have access to water. And in fact, we've actually built out the mirror image of the system, which is sewage that takes waste away from our homes. And instead of subdividing it, read, um, combines it to be treated and returned to. So think of water and, and sewage as mirror images of each other. And again, the key piece here is that this is a collective system, right? In order for this to happen, we have decided that we are going to cooperate and create this, these systems. It's made possible by the fact that we live close to each other. It's made possible by the physical characteristics of water and of networks, and the fact that we all have bodies, and we, our bodies all, we all need water, we all produce waste. So we use these collective systems to meet the basic needs that we have because we are bodies in the world. So the next thing I want to talk about is Amartya Sen. So um, Amartya Sen is a Nobel Prize winning developmental economist, and his research is on the poorest communities in the world. And um, so this is, this is a quote from his book, Development is Freedom. And he comments that, he wrote that we have really, really great reasons for wanting to have wealth. And the reason why we want wealth is not that it's desirable for its own sake, but because Typically, they are admirable general purpose means for having more freedom to lead the kind of lives that we have reason to value, right? And that the usefulness of wealth is not money for its own sake, right? We all understand this, but it's that money and wealth allows us to do things in the world. So I'm not an economist, I'm trained as an engineer, and so I definitely think about the way we do things in the world um, is through energy, right? It's through by, that we need energy to interact in the world. So the first and most important way in which we do this, um, that we have more agency in the world, is through light, through artificial light. And in fact, basically every, in every place in the world where humans have more resources, resources beyond meeting their basic survival needs, those resources, the first thing that they get with those resources pretty much is, is artificial light. Because artificial light is essentially pure agency, right? It means that when the sun goes down, you can still function. It means if you enter an enclosed space, you can still function. And in fact, the relationship between 
resources and artificial light is so good that researchers actually use these sort of nighttime satellite images of regions as a proxy for economic development because there's such a close relationship between access to resources and access to light. But then once we, have a, once we live in a world where we have sort of a sufficiency of artificial light, the kind of next thing that we do is we, we, th we work out other collective ways to, to give agency to us collectively, but it also means using more energy. So these are, of course, electrical pylons. Um, and so I, I, electricity is such a great example of sort of general purpose freedom, right? So you have electricity coming for your, to your house, and you can use it for an incredible variety of things, right? So not just light, but heat for communications, to play electric guitar, to play video games, right? To and you know anything else you, that you want to do in your house. So electricity is certainly one of the more most important examples of the way that energy provides. Energy is a way to collectively provide people with individual agency. Um, and it, you know, it's probably, it's not, it is absolutely not a coincidence that we use power as synonymous with electricity, right? To say that power went out, right? That these two things are virtually synonymous for us. Um, but of course, there are other ways in which we use energy collectively and things like transportation is a good example of that. So if you, um, so this is not a map of, of wealth, of per capita GDP. This is actually a map of energy usage. And so what you can see from this map is the sort of division um, of which company or which, sorry, which countries have higher per capita energy usage. So I'm originally from Canada, and you can see that Canada is dark red here on this map. And you know, some of this is geography. Canada is bigger and colder than the US, right? So it's darker than the US. You can see Sweden here on this map, which is a pretty dark color as well. Um, and then you can see you know, places like Australia, and then you can see sort of the, the, the sort of equatorial band. So this is, again, with this idea that when people have access to wealth and resources, they use that to uh, provide energy for themselves. And the, one of the most effective and efficient ways to do that is by providing it collectively, by creating transportation networks, by creating you know, roads, by creating telecommunication systems. And in fact, this is, this is the real differentiator between the global north and the sort of developing or transitional economies. It's not how rich you are. It's the fact that if you have money, the thing that you purchase is these infrastructural systems that are collective. So that's kind of the space that we're coming from. The other piece of it, of course, is that most of the energy that we use to do all of these things that we get to do every day has historically, well, historically as in the last, it's historically pretty much always come from combustion with a few notable exceptions. And in the last, you know, kind of 150, 200 years, it's pretty much all entirely been fossil fuels. And there's been an exponential increase in the use of fossil fuels, therefore an exponential increase in the amount of greenhouse gas emissions, carbon dioxide in particular associated with that. And that gets us to here. So this is, for those of you who are not familiar with it, this is the, the climate stripes visualization that came out of the University of Reading. Each of these lines is, represents a deviation from a historical average um, annual temperature. And so the darker the blue, it means it's colder, the lighter, sorry, the if it's red, pink or red, it means it's warmer than historical temperatures. And as we move from the past to the present, of course, you can see that it, we're on average getting warmer and warmer years, right? So global warming is here. The impact of that exponential growth is now undeniable, right? That it's always been happening. It's exponential. It's just a lot less obvious at the, the bottom of the exponential curve than it is at the top. So here's where we are. So I'm going to pause and we're going to take a step back to our perspective. This is actually a, a literally a million miles away. Um, this is the, um, the view of Earth from the, the, the Discover um, satellite at, at, or Discover uh, spacecraft at L1. And the physical reality of our planet, there's two parts to this. So one is that our planet is in fact drenched in sunlight. Right, it's constantly getting energy. And in fact, there's so much energy coming in that if everybody on the planet used energy at the rate of energy consuming Canadians, right, at their per capita energy usage, that would still only be a fraction of a percent. So again, this is the thing that probably many of you in this room are aware of, right? That renewable energy is not just like, oh, it's kind of enough for us. It's like it is genuinely, abundantly more than enough for every human on Earth to have access to that energy. And as we just saw, energy is the main way in which we get agency in the world at large, right? So that's the first thing. The second thing that is clear from this 
um, image is that the Earth is surrounded by void, right? It is like hanging in space, surrounded by vacuum. Nothing, you know, all of the atoms on the planet, this is kind of, they have to come from somewhere, they have to go somewhere, right? Barring the odd spacecraft and the odd meteorite, nothing comes in or out of the system. So it is like, it is a, a system where energy is coming into the system in abundance. It is a system where every atom has to come from someplace and go someplace else. And so here's the thing, throughout all of human history, we have been accustomed to thinking of energy as scarce and expensive and matter as kind of cheap and abundant, right? That you can use it, we can do something with it and we can dump it somewhere else and there's always a place to dump it and it'll be fine. And of course, we, are, we have now sort of begun to fully internalize the second part of that, right? The idea that matter is not a thing that we can dump, right? When we talk about whether it's, you know, archeological excavations of midden heaps or whether it's CO2 in the atmosphere or whether it's forever chemicals or microplastics in the water, right? We are fully understanding the limits on the matter side but the other side of it, this idea that we have abundant energy, that is the thing that has genuinely changed. So in about, you know, really about the last 20 years, we've really developed the, the technologies to harness that renewable energy. So like 50 years ago, if we wanted to stop producing greenhouse gases, the only way we could do it was by using less energy. And that is no longer true. So this is actually, this, this image is um, solar panels in uh, Hyderabad in South India. And because the other consequence of this is that renewable energies are distributed and decentralized, right? They're available everywhere in the world. What, whether it's wind or geothermal or solar, they're sort of, uh, they're to be had everywhere. This, I actually love this image in particular because um, if you notice that the panel in the foreground is shiny and the panel in the background is dusty, and it's because these panels are cleaned every day and they sort of rotate through, which means that the ones in the foreground were just cleaned, the dusty ones in the background are the ones that will be cleaned tomorrow relative to this picture. So the other piece of this is that is the matter piece, right? That historically what we've done when we've gotten access to more energy is we've used it and we've used these networks to extract, to move the networks to where something is refined and used vast amounts of energy to refine and to fabricate it, transport it to where it was used, and then typically transport it to where it's discarded, right? And I use aluminum as an example because in the 19th century, aluminum was an actual precious metal, right? And now it is literally disposable, and that's been made possible by the growth of these infrastructural networks, the, the sort of transportation networks, the refining, the vast amount of electricity required to create this. So if the thing we do is we use all of that access to energy and we use it to just do more of the same, we will solve the climate change problem, but we will not address the finite matter on our planet problem, right? So this is a real sort of wake-up call that we can't keep doing things the way that we've been doing, but there is this potential to do something fundamentally different if we think about it that way. So it's time for some new story building. Um, all of these infrastructural networks that we all benefit from are to some extent a utilitarian philosophy mindset, right? This idea of the sort of greatest good for the greatest number, that we build out these networks to benefit us, and they've done an incredible job of allowing us to care for each other's basic needs and our non-basic needs, right? Our sort of needs for communication, our needs for connection, incredibly well. But there are sort of two consequences to the rise of these networks. One is that are sort of integral, right? One is any networks that can bring resources from someplace else to where they're used, by definition, those networks are also taking re resources away from that somewhere else, right, to move it there. And so that's the first thing, right, that extraction piece. The second thing is that they can also be used to displace the harms. So all of these systems have benefits. All of many of these systems, most of these systems, unless they're carefully mitigated, have harms. The benefits are unevenly distributed. The harms are also unevenly distributed. And that, of course, then is also the question about, well, who's making the decision about who gets to benefit, who bears the harms, right? Who are we taking care of? And who are like, well, we'll just let them take care of themselves or worse, right? It's like, you know, at, at, the, at the sort of minimum, it's like unethical. And of course, at its worst, it can be distinctly violent. So I'm just gonna give you a pointer to um, the ethics of care. And so this is work that came out of fem feminist philosophy starting in the 80s. This is Carol Gilligan, is one of the people associated with it. Um, and it's a, it's a philosophy that's based on relational 
understanding. So it's based on understanding of, of dependence and interdependence. It's based on recognizing that everyone for whom the actions have consequences um, needs to be part of the conversation, um, that those who are most vulnerable are the ones that require the most consideration. And so again, if you know this ethics of care is the thing that I'll encourage you to look further, it is not an answer, but it is like a pointer. And many of the things I said sound, will sound familiar to those of you in this room. It is a pointer to a, one of the ways in which we can think about other ways of creating this new world and making these sort of underlying philosophies explicit. So to finally, so I'm ending with a lesser known Ursula. And Ursula, this is Ursula Franklin, a Canadian scientist and scholar who wrote, central to any new order that can shape and direct technology and human destiny. And that's what we're talking about, right? We're talking about this technological transformation will be a renewed emphasis on the concept of justice. So I'm going to end there. This was a very thin slice of a very deep dive. And as Imagine said, I have a book coming out this fall. Um, and if you'd like to go on the deeper dive with me, I'll point you towards that. Thank you so much. Thank <laughs> you.